that it had, as spores can do, traveled through space, come down here many, many eons ago. We'd eaten those little caps out of the dung on the plains of Africa, and it sparked our evolution, our consciousness, and ultimately its aim was to advance our consciousness so that we could become spacefaring and take the spore elsewhere. <laughs> That's just one of his ideas. But he, he went on to finally experiment with DMT, and he came away with the belief that, as he said, it was a UFO experience on demand. Now, I recall, <laughs> I didn't actually see this, but he was here in Austin at the Whole Life Expo, and both he and Whitley Strieber were uh, among the attendees and giving lectures on their respective areas of inquiry. Now, uh, McKenna often, I think, was kind of dismissive of, of Whitley and the abduction narrative. He would, be, he would vehemently say, what I'm describing is not that. And yet, there's a lot of people who wondered, well, are you so sure when basically this drug that occurs naturally in the human body, occurs naturally in a number of different plants, um, seems to uh, create an experiencing of visiting another realm. So he suggested that it could provide insight into the way in which the cultural feedback thermostat explanation of UFOs put forth by Valet and others actually works. Those people who experience the DMT seizure and are plunged into the current myth of the other actually return as apostles of that myth, able to clarify and refine it, and by those means to exert the tuning and control of historical development that may be the purpose of the agency behind the UFOs. Now here, he, he was often uh, at odds with Valet on Valet's ideas about UFOs. Valet, besides thinking that there was a true alien intelligence, also believes that there are human agencies who have figured out some aspects of the UFO phenomena and are using it for their own purposes. That's where McKenna says, though, you're just paranoid, man. Um, but uh, here, McKenna uh, captures Valet's control system hypothesis and, and calls it the cultural thermostat hypothesis, which is actually pretty accurate because uh, McKenna has suggested that the uh, control system that he posits is behind the UFO phenomena is constantly adjusting humanity's course every time we start getting either too scientific or too mystical. That it somehow is, is, is a control mechanism like your air conditioning system keeping it not too hot and not too cold so that we keep on this path ever moving forward. Um, all right, so yeah, I, and I really like the, uh, the caduceus symbolism uh, there, connecting it to the mushroom. And I've seen some other similar drawings that show the mushroom and the pillar of light as being connected. All right, now, DMT has actually been scientifically researched, thankfully, uh, in a country that represses all experiencing of anything but normal beta waking consciousness, this man has managed to uh, get permission from the government to investigate the effects of DMT on volunteers. Um, this new movie has been, just been released this month, DMT the Spirit Molecule, and in fact uh, its uh, creators, producers are from here in Austin, so there's an Austin connection. Um, it's available for streaming online. I have yet to see it myself, but I, I, I'm uh, looking forward to it. It's got a wide range of researchers, both eth ethnobotanists, psychologists, um, as well as a lot of people that you'll recognize from the paranormal and new age field. But basically, he, uh, Rick Strassman, investigated the effects and came away uh, with lots of reports from the volunteers who said that they experienced an alien other, and that they felt that they were going to some other realm. And they felt certain that this was a real and physical, even though they know they'd been dosed, so it's kind of like, well, you know, I know I was under the influence, but... So 
this is uh, another area that could be explored as having relevance to these other worlds that are often described. Now, Aldous Huxley is famous uh, in the drug realm as well for uh, his exploration of psychedelics. And he really, I thought, sums it up well. And this is, gets to the idea, the issue of perception itself. You know, if you really look at the science of perception and consciousness, you come away realizing that your experiencing of everything that you consider real is illusory. That perception is simply a virtual reality construct that helps you navigate the real world, the real world. And that's kind of what Huxley was trying to uh, put forth. He said that, uh, or uh, Wikipedia says, he believes that psychotropic drugs can partly remove this filter, which leaves the drug user exposed to mind at large. And this mind at large idea is very similar to ideas expressed by Carl Jung about the collective unconscious, the idea that there is a, a ground state of being that represents uh, all knowledge, all information, and that we can experience this. Now, that's one of the things that led me to my own experimentation with psychedelics um, was the desire to try and see what it's like to take away some of those filters. You know, there, there's a number of different ways one can experiment with consciousness, whether it be through breathing, food and diet, uh, or chemicals in the form of drugs. And any one of these techniques or tools can help you realize just how much of your perception is enculturated, is taught to you by your society, and which largely these, these filters are there to allow you to be able to interact with people in a normal waking reality. But when some of those filters are removed, we start noticing things, we start experiencing things, we start sensing things. And I think, as he was suggesting with this idea of mind at large, that human consciousness can have access to all places, all times, all information. And that's something that the parapsychological literature backs up. So, of course, it was Carl Jung who suggested this idea of the collective unconscious and the idea that there are these archetypes that serve as the uh, modalities through which so much of our experience uh, is experienced. Now, there are many better uh, scholars than I to uh, explain Carl Jung, and there's a lot of disagreement. His ideas, of course, about UFOs have been misrepresented and misinterpreted by a number of different people, and some of the people we'll talk about tonight um, could be uh, accused of the same. Um, but his, his, idea of, his ideas about the collective unconscious and UFOs uh, recur over and over again throughout the literature of, I think, the, the best postmodern UFO researchers. Uh, as Jacques Vallée says, uh, is the mechanism of UFO apparitions then an invariant in all cu cultures? Are we faced here with something more than a projection of Jung's archetypal images, a psychic technology whose applications know few, if any, limitations in space and time? I see no better hypothesis at this point of our knowledge of UFO phenomena. So these are just some uh, uh, illustrations to give you a little idea of, of, of the, uh, the, the collective unconscious, the, the iceberg metaphor. Uh, or analogy is, is a good one in that there's this tip of the iceberg that's above the water that represents your normal waking consciousness and underneath that water is a far larger potential mass uh, that overlaps with everyone else's experience. Um, the general idea of archetypes in the collective unconscious is that wherever they might come from we don't know but that there are these, these uh, eminent forms, these archetypes that uh, represent like the oldest experiencings of humanity and that they're intimately connected to Jung's idea of synchronicity, of um, meaningful coincidence.
Okay, right. Back to Terrence McKenna. Here he's just saying um, that, that uh, Jung was at great pains to not dismiss the claims of people who had seen UFOs. Um, some people interpret uh, Jung's ideas uh, as saying that UFOs were not physical at all, that they were purely a psychological phenomena, purely a ma manifestation of people's yearning for uh, save salvation from above, uh, whereas others uh, have argued that, that Jung's ideas about the archetypes and UFOs were more dynamic and physically real. Um, he also points out that Jung thought that the, the area of parapsychology played an important role in uh, our ability to understand the nature of UFOs. Now, this idea that this is all fantasy or the imagination um, is, I, I think, of course, at the heart of this. And it's years ago, I had the pleasure of going to a conference in London called Otherworld Reality, Exploring the Ontological Status of the Imaginal. And that was where I learned what the word imaginal meant. <laughs> um, there's a French scholar named Henry Corbin who was a researcher into the, the spiritual aspects of Islam. And the thing he came away with was that there was no good terminology in Western uh, science to adequately capture the perceived physical reality of these mystical experiences that he was reading about in these Islamic mysticism uh, encounters. And so he coined the phrase the imaginal. And a whole range of uh, UFO researchers that are more New Age oriented, more paranormal oriented, uh, have taken up that mantle as, as, and reclaimed it because, again, so many times people are quick to describe or dismiss these things as being imaginary, where the imaginal is simply a way of, of uh, terming these things as being more real. Now, uh, Kenneth Ring has done one of the most important works, I, in my estimation, on the UFO subject. Um, some of you may be familiar with Dr. Kenneth Ring. He was a pioneering researcher in the near-death experience. Uh, people who uh, have had those experiences that often are described as being the tunnel of light and the life review and this seeming experiencing of an afterlife and then coming back to re report it to the rest of us. Well, at some point, um, I believe it was his publisher, brought to his attention the works of Whitley Strieber. And, of course, at first he was thinking, you know, I've already had a hard enough time getting any kind of academic respect studying the near-death experience. Why would I want to take on something as wild as the abduction phenomena? And so, but he, he put that aside and, and he delved into it and he immediately saw parallels and so he started what uh, later became known as the Omega Project, where he ex uh, did a study of people who'd had both near-death experiences as well as um, uh, alien abduction and close encounters. Um, Kenneth Ring is the professor emeritus of psychology at the University of Connecticut and he's the founder and past president of the International Association for Near Death Studies. Um, his book that he published on the subject that I highly recommend is The Omega Project, Near Death Experiences, UFO Encounters, and Mind at Large. He also published a book called Mindsight, Near Death and Out-of-Body Experiences of the Blind. Um, 